It's great, great pleasure to have uh, Hamlet Ishwaran here to deliver our uh, next uh, so second in our seminar series in biostatistics here at, the, at UM. Um, Hamlet and I go way back. We've been working together for about 12 years now. And um, he's, he's a, an extremely I interesting guy in terms of the, the breadth of work that he gets involved in, in his ability to marry theory with applications and his ability to translate things into uh, computer applications that people can actually use and do use around the world. So he's a very, very sort of cross-cutting uh, kind of researcher. Uh, he, he got his, I just want to read from this so I make sure I get everything right. He's, he got his PhD in statistics uh, at Yale University in 1993 working with David Pollard. Uh, before that, he was at Oxford University doing his master's, and earlier to that, he was at the University of Toronto where he got his uh, bachelor's degree. Uh, he's got a wide range of interests, um, from cancer staging to random forest, which is what we'll see today, uh, to Bayesian and frequentist variable selection, uh, modeling high-throughput genomic data, mixture models, non-parametric bays, a variety of different things, some very theoretical, some more applied. He's currently an associate editor for the Journal of the American Statistical Association, the Theory and Methods section, the Electronic Journal of Statistics, and Statistics and Probability Letters. Um, as I said, there's, a, there's some software that he's developed. Um, part of it I've been involved with, part of it uh, he, he's had a long history of doing this. Um, for example, the BAM array software that we, we jointly worked on, that's for uh, genomic analysis of uh, high throughput uh, microarray data. And then some of it, which is more related to his work today, on random forest for survival, classification, and regression data. This is also get, getting some wide distribution around the world. So it's a great pleasure for, for uh, us to have him here. And uh, today he's going to speak on random forests, uh, theory, and applications for variable selection. So welcome. Dan. OK, well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so today I wanted to talk about random forests. Um, actually, applications of uh, random forest in terms of variable selection. This is a little bit different because um, random forest is a machine learning technique or sometimes called a statistical learning technique, which is often thought of as a black box tool for doing prediction. But um, there are many scenarios where it can actually be used for variable selection. So I wanted to talk about that by um, talking about um, the classical method used for variable selection and use some examples to illustrate that. Then also I want to get into some new methods that we've developed um, and illustrate those both uh, theoretically and as well through some applications. Um, so first, when I, when I was putting together this talk, I thought, well, I'll just jump right in and start talking about variable selection. But um, uh, given the fact that maybe there's sort of a very you know broad background in the audience, um, I decided to instead um, start off with a little bit of an introduction, some background material. But rather than talking about random forest, I'm going to talk about something else, which is called bagging, which stands for bootstrap aggregating. Um, this is a method due to Leo Breiman in 1996. Um, and this is also um, an ensemble method, just like random forest. And, and in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to argue that random forest is really just a specialized version of bagging. So let me, uh, let me just uh, start off by um, uh, highlighting how uh, Bryman actually described bagging in his, uh, in his original paper. So the, the first part, of it, it's actually a two-part uh, description. So the first part is um, <clears throat> bagging predictors is a method for generating multiple versions of a predictor and using these to get an aggregated predictor. So this is all about prediction error, okay? It's all about um, sort of averaging and perturbing, okay? So the, the perturbation, and this is a, actually pretty much the you know, 99% of bagging applications work by using the bootstrap. So you resample the data, and then you grow your predictor, and then you average, you ensemble, take an ensemble of these, these different predictors. Um, but one thing that you may be confusing is that this is not a bootstrap. So we use the bootstrap here as a way to perturb the data. We're not really using the bootstrap to approximate the distribution for a test statistic. Um, the second part of this description is when it works, okay? So if you can perturb the learning set, right, by taking the bootstrap as an example, um, and if this can cause a significant change in the predictor constructed, then bagging can improve accuracy, okay? And, and this is actually what, what Bryman and, and, ha and now is commonly referred to as instability. So if you have an unstable predictor, it's a prime candidate for being a good um, bagged predictor, 
And I'll get into that um, shortly enough. So I wanted to start by, um, by uh, an example. So I'm gonna look at um, bag classification trees, so cart trees. And uh, what you see uh, on the left-hand side is um, a classification tree um, grown um, using just a small cancer data set. So in this particular data set, we have patients who uh, either had prostate cancer or they did not. And the goal here is to create a classification rule to distinguish these two types of patients based on, in this case, two variables, uh, tumor volume and PSA level. So um, CART and, and more generally recursive partitioning trees are very greedy data structures, mm -hmm. right? So they rip through the data and they do it in a very greedy fashion. Um, so if you look at any given terminal node, and so the top of the tree is called the root, uh, sorry, if you look at any node and, and, the, and the top of the tree, which is called the root node, um, essentially what you do is you just go over all the data. You go over every variable, you look at every possible split point, and you choose that split point that, based on a greedy splitting rule, best separates the population. So typically in classification trees, the splitting rule used is um, what's called the Gini index. Um, and once you find this split point in this variable, so in this case, tumor volume, so all patients whose tumor volume is less than this number go over here, everybody else goes over here, you then repeat this recursively on the left daughter node and the right daughter node. So it's a recursive procedure, and it's very greedy. Um, so, so this is done until um, you get to the, the terminal nodes, and uh, in the case of a classification tree, the predictor is just formed by doing majority voting. So over here, um, the number of non-disease patients are in the majority, and that's your predicted value, okay? Um, now, um, this is actually, so, so the CAR tree is actually a bona fide predictor, right? In the sense that if you take a, a patient and you drop it down the tree, they're actually gonna end up in a unique terminal node, and in that terminal node, you'll get their predicted value, okay? So another way to, to think about this is that um, what the, the predictor really is sort of doing here is it's forming a partition of the X um, variable space, okay? And because of the way that, um, that the splits are done, the, um, the partition is such that it's just a bunch of these little rectangles, okay? They're non-overlapping rectangles, and they're designed in such a way that the edge of any rectangle is always gonna be parallel to the coordinate axes of the X variable space, okay? And um, in fact, on the right-hand side, you could see um, the decision space that's carved out by this uh, tree on the left-hand side. Um, so the, the white and, and green points are the actual observed data points, and they've been color-coded um, based on the true class label, whether the patient was, um, had cancer or not, okay? And you can see um, the blue area where the classification tree predicts um, that the patient is not diseased. It's doing a pretty decent job um, of sort of separating these two groups out. Although there is a um, little bit of um, problems in the middle. There's some misclassification occurring in the middle. Um, maybe some points over here, but you know, generally speaking, it's doing a decent job. The other thing that's kind of interesting about trees is that if you look at it, you can see that the decision boundary is rectilinear, right? It's this very sort of very straight and very nicely defined thing. And that's again a very, it's a, that's a special feature of using um, a binary tree, a recursive binary tree. Okay, so, um, so here's how bagging would, would work in, the, in this scenario. Okay, so what I did was, um, I drew uh, 999 bootstrap samples, and, and on the basis of each of these, I grew a tree uh, independently based on that particular sample. And what you can see here are, are um, some of these trees, uh, tree two, tree five, two, tree 25, and 1,000. Tree one is the original data set, um, and this is grown based on the original full data set, but I guess that's a, a special type of bootstrap sample. Um, the other thing I did was slightly different than tree one. I actually grew these trees out fully, okay? So I grew them out so that um, there was exactly one observation per terminal node. So that's a deep tree. Okay, so um, I guess the first thing to notice is that 
when you bootstrap the data and you go deep tree, you can get very different types of tree structures. So you can see the decision boundary is very different from uh, tree one to tree 25 and so forth. Okay, and so Baggy is going to is going to take advantage of this. Um, the bottom row are the bag trees, so that's tree one, and then this tree here is the combination, the the aggregate uh, bag tree from aggregating tree one and tree two. And as you can see, what it's doing is it's sort of synthesizing information from the two trees. It's, it's taking both trees and carving out a slightly different decision boundary. Um, when you go to the uh, let's say the first five trees, you can start to see that the decision boundary is, is, is being carved out in a way that looks like it's trying to get at those points that were misclassified in the center, and then there's this sort of funny island over here. And after a thousand trees, you can see sort of a complex decision boundary emerging, which does pretty much just that. Okay, so this ensembling is a technique for using the different tree structures that you get by perturbing the data. Um, and this translates into prediction accuracy, improvement in prediction error. So if you look at the misclassification error rate, in this case, um, computed using out-of-bag data, for the bag tree, it's 27.2%. Um, for any given single tree, the average over all the out-of-bag data sets using that as uh, test data is 34.9%. So it's a decent improvement in prediction accuracy. And it's such a simple technique, right? You didn't have to do anything different. If you, could grow, if you could grow a tree, just grow a thousand, take the average, okay? Um, okay, so, um, so we sort of know how to do bagging, um, but when does it work? So that's the second part of the description by Bryman, and, and that, the key has to do with instability, okay? So um, I think if you think about it, you might be able to convince yourself that this is really sort of about the variance, right? So when we're perturbing the data, we're really sort of saying, hey, let's pretend we actually had another data set and grow a tree and see what we get. So instability is really sort of how much does a tree vary around the average tree, okay? And that's, that's what we call variance. Um, so this plays a role with, um, with trees that are deep because as you grow a, a deep tree, like I did um, in our previous example, you're, kind of, you're using up a lot of degrees of freedom. So when you use up a lot of degrees of freedom, uh, bias goes down, and that's great, but at the same time, you know, nothing's for free, variance goes up, okay? So that's the bad thing. And you might argue, well, why do that then? So if you're gonna get high variance, don't do that. But the problem is that in complex decision boundary scenarios, you have no choice. The only way to get at a deep tree is to, uh, sorry, the only way to get at a, at a complex decision boundary is to grow a deep tree. Um, and I, I kind of, I want to show this um, by a classical example. So one of the things that trees have real difficulty in is recovering decision boundaries that are oblique to the coordinate axes, right? So as I said before, the partition that you get is always parallel to the coordinate axis. So I simulated some data here. Um, the true decision boundary is this thick plate which is oriented obliquely to the coordinate axis. The green points and the white points are the true class labels. The left hand side is, is a cart tree, a shallow cart tree, and on the right hand side, the blue and red squares is the decision boundary. So it's a red square inside a blue square. Um, it's not doing a very good job, obviously. Well, grow the tree out a little more deeply um, and you can see that the region that the decision region is becoming a little bit more complicated. You, you have two or three squares now that are sort of identifying the, the class labels. Grow it out more deeply and it's starting to look a little bit better. Go as far as you can and, and you've done a decent job. But the problem here is that um, variance goes up, right? Lots of degrees of freedom is being expended here in growing this tree. Bias is low, variance is high, so you have a problem. Okay, um, so what we would do in that scenario is we would bag, okay? Because it's, it works in these scenarios where there's high variance. Um, but why does it work? Okay, so we know, you know how to implement it. We know that it will work in the case where we have this instability, i.e. variance, but why does it work? And I just wanna show you a very simple uh, explanation for how this works in the, in the case of a regression tree. So although I looked at a classification tree it's a little bit easier to explain it, um, how it would apply in the case where your outcome is not a class label, but it's a continuous value. But this argument actually applies directly to classification trees and, and it can be extended to 
general outcomes as well. Okay, so here's the argument. Suppose this is your predictor, f hat. You're trying to predict y. It's based on some function. You don't know that function, and there's an error term. Um, let's compute the generalization error. So the generalization error is, is kind of like the averaged, averaged, averaged error, okay? So give me um, a new x value from a test data set and the y value. How close can you predict that y value? Square it up and then average this out over the test data set and now average this out over the training data set, the learning data set that you actually grew f hat. So it's just averaging the square distance. Um, it's not hard to show, just take the square, expand things out, you'll see a cross product term disappears that you get the following expression, which is basically a mean square error decomposition. Mm -hmm. First term is the internal noise, that's the lower bound to the generalization error. The second term is the bias, okay? So this is the difference between the true predictor and the mean of your predictor, squared, and the, the other term is the variance. So that's the difference between your predictor and its mean value, okay? So you get this mean square error decomposition. Well, apply the same argument to the mean of your predictor, and you'll find that, um, in fact, that the generalization error is equal to the prediction error, the generalization error for the mean, plus this term here, which is the variance, right? So there's two things that follow from this. The prediction error for your predictor is always bigger than the averaged predictor, and the amount is equal to the variance, right? So by taking the average, you completely remove the variance. The variance drops to zero. And so it's so it, bagging is a variance reduction technique. Uh, and that sounds great, but there's of course one catch, right? Taking the average means that I'd have to average this out over uh, the training data set. So I'd actually have to have an infinite number of these independent data sets out there, which we don't have. In practice, we have one data set. So that's where the bootstrapping comes in. The bootstrapping acts like uh, a way of generating these, you know, pseudo ways of generating these, these training data sets. But the, that's the principle. Um, finally, as a corollary, if your original predictor is unbiased, then taking the average of it will also be unbiased. So what will happen here is the generalization error for your predictor will be just sigma squared. So the bias term drops off and the variance term drops off. So it's the perfect predictor, taking an average of an unbiased predictor is the best thing to do. And that's sort of what bagging does, right? It takes a low bias, high variance predictor, like a tree with lots of degrees of freedom, and it turns it into a stable, more accurate ensemble learner. Okay, now here's the catch, and this is sort of the segue into random forests. Um, so you, 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 the, in the example that I showed you, there's just two variables, but in many problems, we have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe millions of variables nowadays. Um, in those scenarios, this perturbation through bootstrapping is not enough to, to remove the, uh, to reduce the variance. What happens is that the trees that you build by these bootstrap samples um, aren't decorrelated enough, and you need to decorrelate them, okay? And the only way that you can decorrelate them is to change the technique. Um, and so this is really sort of the idea behind random forest. Okay, so what random forest does is it, instead of bagging a deep tree, it will bag a deep random tree. Okay, so inject another form of randomization into the process to reduce the variance. So it's, it, again, it's, it's a variance reduction technique. Um, so here's how Breiman described uh, random forest in his 2001 paper. Um, it's a combination of tree predictors such that each tree depends on the values of a random vector sampled independently and with the same distribution for all trees in the forest. So in other words, um, you basically construct random trees and then you aggregate them. Now, um, this could be done in, in many, many, many different ways, but the prescription that he laid out and studied in his paper, which is sometimes called random forest random input, is actually very simple and involves three steps. So just like bagging, um, you draw B independent bootstrap samples, but here's the, here's the, the part where you infuse um, some more randomization into the tree growing process. For each, tr each node, when you're splitting the node, right, with this greedy splitting rule, instead of using all variables, select m tri of them, 
Okay, so m tri is some number that's less than or equal to p, where p is the number of variables. So if m tri equals p, then you're selecting all the variables and you're going to essentially do bagging. Um, in practice, m tri is far, much, much smaller than p. And then finally, um, you grow the tree deeply with um, a fixed node size. So for any given terminal node, the number of um, uh, values in that terminal node may have a lower bound on it, which is typically called um, node size. So to implement random forest random input, there's three variables or three tuning parameters, B, M, Tri, and node size. Um, selecting B is very straightforward. This is just a computational issue. You can't overfit by growing too many trees, so it's just really a matter of how many trees you can grow computationally. Um, the two key variables are M, Tri, and node size, and there are default settings that are used um, in the software that's available out there. And, and these work very well, and they're also fairly robust in most settings. But as I'm going to sort of get into later in my talk, um, once you start to get into these challenging problems, especially with high dimensional, um, with high dimensional um, scenarios, um, selecting M tri and node size has to be thought of very carefully. You really have to think carefully about how to, how to tune these parameters. And I'll show you um, some theory for, in, for how, to, how to actually do that. Um, just to mention that there are many uh, other approaches for random forest that actually are very, very similar to Bryman's method. Um, Ho's decision forest, especially uh, Ahmed and Gieman's shape recognition papers are really sort of independently discovered random forest. In fact, they really influence Bryman's work a lot. Um, so there are many, many ways of growing random trees. Okay, so now um, let me sort of get into uh, variable importance, um, variable selection. So in forests, so uh, up to this point, we've been talking about prediction error. Now let's sort of think about being able to select variables. And the way that this is done uh, almost exclusively, predominantly in the literature is to use variable importance, measures of the predictiveness of a variable. I like to call it VIMP. Okay, so this is a prediction error based approach. Not surprisingly, forest is a prediction error approach. So it's not surprising that the, the traditional way of doing this is, is based on that concept. Um, so what one would does is, it get, is to construct these VIMP measures um, and then rank variables based on it and then filter the variables um, based on that, that ordering. And computing VIMP is, is actually quite straightforward. Um, so for each tree, uh, you just run out of bag data down the tree. So remember, each tree is grown using bootstrap data. The data that's left out, about 37% um, of the data, is called out of bag. That, you can use that as test data. So you run it down the tree. Let's suppose V is your variable of interest. Whenever you come to a split, if that split is on V, just make a random assignment. Go left or right randomly. Okay, so you kind of mess up the, the, uh, the path of the, of, the, of the data point. Now, if V is an important variable, what will happen is that the terminal node assignment for the data point is going to be far away from its actual original um, terminal node assignment. And that is how you can um, determine whether V is informative. Okay, so the second part is from uh, doing this sort of noising up, determine the outer bag ensemble. Okay, so for each individual, you have about th uh, 370 trees out of th 1,000 that um, were out of bag, and use those, average them out, and from this, compute the prediction error. So this is the prediction error for the noised up variable. Now, calculate the prediction error for the original. Um, uh, the original predictor um, using the, its out-of-bag ensemble. Then to compute VIMP, just take the difference between the two. So basically, if you noise up a variable, it's going to increase its prediction error. And the difference between that and the original prediction error is the VIMP. The larger mm -hmm. it is, the more positive it is, the more, in, the more indication that that variable is informative. Here's just a, a sort of a simple illustration of this. I want to return to the oblique decision boundary, the simulated data that we just looked at. So here's the, um, the carved out decision boundary and the true uh, classification labels color coded. On, uh, on this figure here is the prediction error when I noised up the X variable, okay? And here's the prediction, uh, sorry, here's the prediction for uh, when I noised up the Y variable. So you can see that by noising up the variables that the prediction uh, is being affected, and when you compute the prediction error, you will be easily able to find that both variables are informative. Okay. Um, 
All right, so now I want to kind of get into a, an example in a little more detail. Um, this is actually ongoing work, but the, the results are interesting, I guess, and exciting enough that I thought it would be make a nice example for, for today's seminar. Um, so this is related to uh, myelodysplastic syndromes, or what's known as MDS. Um, and these are um, a collection of uh, varied um, uh, diseases which affect the, the bone marrow. Um, so within the bone marrow um, are blood stem cells, and these blood stem cells produce other um, blood cells. But in MDS patients, the blood stem cells are affected in such a way that, the, um, that they're not able to produce enough healthy blood cells. And as you can imagine, this has serious consequences for the health of the patient. Um, Roughly, in fact, uh, about a third of MDS patients will progress on, onwards to AML, which is um, uh, a serious form of leukemia. So um, this is a, a disease that uh, affects uh, both men and women. Um, it's more common in men, but, um, more, but very importantly, it, it's, it's a disease of the elderly population. So. For example, typically MDS patients are between the ages of 60 and 75. And this is important because it really limits um, treatment options. Um, for, for, for instance, um, probably the only curative therapy for MDS at this point is bone marrow transplantation. But because of the age of the patient um, and because of health, this is not a, a, a viable treatment option for, for many MDS patients. So for this and, and other reasons, uh, researchers have been turning to molecular biology and genomics as a way to, to study MDS. Um, and um, one thing that's known fairly well about MDS is that chromosome aberrations um, are well known to be implicated in the disease process. So um, cytogenetics, for example, 50% of patients will have some form of um, chromosome aberrations that can be picked up using metaphase cytogenetics. So, Looking at, um, as an example, um, looking at um, genotype poly genetic polymorphisms or SNPs is a, a very sort of uh, fruitful way to think about attacking this, this problem. And um, we have a group over now at the Cancer Center who have been studying um, MDS um, by looking at um, SNP data uh, that I've been working at with. And um, they were very interested in, in, in um, using random forest to, um, to study mm -hmm. this, this disease. So what we thought we would try to do is um, using some type of SNP data to generate um, a SNP signature which um, could classify accurately an MDS patient from a control patient. And um, so they, they have collected some, uh, some data on this using um, the new Affymetrix SNP arrays. Uh, these are the 6.0 arrays. Um, very high resolution SNP ar uh, arrays which have something like over 900,000 SNP calls uh, per individual. So these are the variables in the model. Um, so as you can imagine with, with um, 900,000 variables, this is you know, like a massively high dimensional problem. And so to try to develop a classifier with 900,000 variables is, is really going to be um, you know, very challenging to conventional methods. Um, but at the same time, um, it also uh, poses a problem to even sophisticated machine learning methods. So even uh, without some form of, of dimension reduction, even methods like random forest and other machine learning methods, it's not going to be possible to do accurate variable selection. And in fact, um, as I get into it a little bit more on my slides, um, I'll sort of talk about the, the trade-off between P and N that's needed to be able to do accurate variable selection. So the first thing I did when I got this data was to uh, reduce the dimensionality to about 5,000 uh, SNPs using, um, you know, univariate p-values with um, a fairly liberal p-value thresholding um, value. So this gave me um, a training data set of about 2,400 patients, of which um, 181 were um, MDS patients. Now this may actually look like a small number, but this is a fairly rare disease. Um, in the US, the incidence rate is probably about 10 to 20,000 per year. Um, however, um, because the, um, the class frequencies are, are so unbalanced, you have to be a little bit careful. Okay, so 
if you if you grow a tree or if you grow a forest, a multi-class forest, um, on, mul on multi-class data where the class labels are unbalanced, what happens is that the tree growing process is completely dominated by the maturity class label. And the prediction error is driven by that, and VIMP is driven by that. So if you want to be able to sort of identify important variables, you have to take that into account. And one technique that, that works really well is to use balanced subsampling. So rather than actually using all the data where you have, uh, you know, a majority of the data is, is from controls, what I did was I actually used balanced subsampling where I would randomly select from the controls um, the same sample size as from the MDS patient population to create a balanced data set. Okay, so I did this 1,000 times. For each of these data sets, I grew a classification forest. Um, oh yeah, one more thing. Um, so in, in growing this, uh, in, in, in doing each analysis, I also reduced the SNPs further. So from the 5,000 SNPs, I actually took 10% of these SNPs in each analysis. Again, this has to do with um, the size of N, the sample size related to the dimensionality P. Okay, so from each of these 1,000 analyses, you get um, a VIMP for each variable, which you can then rank. And what I did was I just kept the top SNPs, um, the top 200 SNPs, as ranked by the average VIMP. Once this was done, um, we, we extracted a fresh te test data set. So this is based on the same platform, but from a different institute, actually from a different country, with um, similar sample sizes in the cases and the controls, okay? So, um, so here are the results. And um, what I'm showing you here is the, the top 100 SNPs. The blue curve um, is random forest, the red curve is GLM, which is logistic regression in this case. So we're looking at MDS versus controls. Um, and what I did was I fit a, um, a forest sequentially. So based on the first top SNP, based on the, set, uh, the first top two SNPs, and then the first top three SNPs and so forth, all the way up to 100. And then I did the same thing for GLM. Um, so that's the number of SNPs on the x-axis. On the y-axis is the test set area under the curve. Okay, so you can construct an ROC curve and you can compute the area under the curve. And this is test set based because the forest was calculated on our original training learning data set, but now it's tested on this new institutional data. So you see some very interesting things. Um, first of all, the, um, the area under the curve increases, but you know, not really rapidly, it takes some time. In fact, if you run this thing out to 200 SNPs, which were the number we kept, you could get the area under the curve to 97%. Not bad. Um, the other thing is um, GLM does a decent job, but eventually it kind of seems to take a hit and it never seems to recover. And, and my reason for, for using GLM was really one, one, one reason only, and that was I wanted to see if there was some sort of interaction going on between the SNPs, right? Since the GLM here is only based on an additive model, this would be a way to see if SNPs were somehow interacting independent, uh, sort of uh, acting in an um, interactive way. Um, Although that may be a little bit confounded with the fact that because this is GLM MLE based, there could be issues about um, you know uh, parameter estimation. I still think that you know it's it's very interesting that the the difference in the areas under the curve. Um, you can see that there there may be something at, at play. Um, so the large number of SNPs here I think is is interesting as well. Um, the fact that you kind of have to run out to 200 SNPs to get a really good area under the curve, um, kind of matches the, the diversity that we see in the clinical data. Okay, um, oh, one other thing. So this was very interesting. So I learned something very interesting about the Bayes classifier in this problem. So on the y-axis, um, what I've plotted here is the, um, the out-of-bag prediction. So this is the, the probability that a patient is uh, MDS. And to do this, what I, what I did was I took the, the test data set and the 200 SNPs that we identified and constructed a forest on the test data, and I used the um, out-of-bag data to compute the, the uh, predicted probabilities. And what you can see here is that 50%, which is the threshold for defining the Bayes rule, right? If, if the predicted probability is over 50%, you vote for disease. Otherwise, you vote for not disease, so you get a blue or red point. But these are actually the true class labels. And as you can see, you get very good separation. 
Um, and then I noticed the same thing on the training data set that when I was doing this, that um, I was getting very good misclassification error rates. But when I took the forest constructed on the training data and I computed it on the test data, I was getting very poor misclassification error rates and I realized why, because this has to do with the Bayes rule. So over here are the predicted probabilities for the forest grown on the training data and then tested and then compute on the testing data. And what you can see is that the predicted probabilities are shrunk much more towards zero. So here's the Bayes rule, right? So the Bayes rule would say, well, everything over here has got to be blue and everything over here has got to be red, but 50% is far too high. You'd probably do much better over here near 30% or 35%. In fact, when I saw this, I realized that really mis misclassification error rates and using Bayes rules could be very deceptive in these multi-class problems where you have different frequencies for class labels. That the best thing to do is to look at the ROC curve. And from there, you know, depending on what your sensitivity and specificity needs are, then define your, your classifier. Okay, so um, now I kind of I want to start moving into um, some of the new ideas that we have about variable selection, and this was um, something that we published recently in JASA Theory and Methods, um, and um, it's it's a it's a it's a different way of, of sort of doing variable selection. For the, the most important thing that that di that that makes it different than VIMP is that it's not prediction error based, yet at the same time. The idea is sort of is trying to get at the same concept that VIMP is trying to get at, which is that because of the greedy um, splitting nature of the tree, the where a variable splits is very informative about how predictive and how useful that variable is. Okay, so it's all about real estate, the position of a variable in a tree. Let me let me explain this a little bit more. Um, so uh, this is a survival tree. I've inverted it now. So this is the root node. Um, and so it's a survival tree based on some uh, stress test data that we collected from heart failure patients. Um, so the minimal depth is really sort of the distance from the root node to the first time that uh, the tree splits on the variable of interest, okay? And to make this um, sort of precise, we, we, we define what we call a maximal subtree. So it's the biggest tree such that that tree root node is split on that variable. So the root node in this case is split at exercise time and um, its maximal subtree is the root is the whole tree itself, right? So that's the first time that exer exercise time is split and the distance from this to the root node is zero. So it has a depth of zero. So small values indicate a variable which is very important. Uh, another example is peak VO2, so peak um, oxygen consumption. Um, you can see two maximal subtrees, one red over here and one red sort of in the middle. Um, this is the first time that this subtree splits. It has a depth of one. And this is the first time that this subtree splits, splits on peak VO2 and it has a depth of three. So what's the closest distance to the root node? One. Right? So you can have several maximal subtrees for a variable. So the closest one to the root node tells you the minimal depth. It, I mean, in a nutshell, it's, it's like a first order statistic. The closer you are to the root node, the more informative. And that's what VIP is trying to do, right? Because by noising up a variable, you're sort of sending a, a data point to a terminal node far from its original assignment. So it's all about positioning in the tree. Okay, so what are the advantages of doing this? I think one, uh, one uh, immediate advantage is that it's um, independent of the prediction error. Okay, so um, this can have some, some very useful advantages. One uh, good example is survival analysis where um, there's some controversy about what's a good uh, way to actually measure prediction error. So some people say that using Harrell's concordance index is a good technique. Others will argue that the Breyer score is, is, is useful. Um, another reason that you may want to sort of get away from thinking about prediction error is that there are scenarios where it's not even clear exactly how to measure prediction error. For, for example, in um, competing risks where you have multiple events um, that you're looking at, what is the event that you should focus on? Since you could have prediction error for all the events, which one should you focus on? And as we start to get into more and more complex outcomes, mixed outcomes where uh, instead of looking at an outcome with one dimension, let's say we're looking at D dimensions. We have continuous values, survival values, um, multi-class data, uh, whatever. 
what is the prediction error? Which outcome should I look at? So as soon as you start to distance yourself away from prediction error, you can start to think about force in a very general framework, a, a variable selection with force in a very general framework. Um, another great advantage is that unlike VIMP, which is a randomization technique, we can actually study uh, minimal depth. And what, we'll, what I'll show you is that one can actually work out the distribution so that you can define a thresholding value to define a variable as being informative. Another uh, very useful feature is that it's not reliant on the Monte Carlo scheme that's used to grow the tree. So in random forest, we use bootstrap data, but suppose we don't actually want to bootstrap the data. Suppose we want to change the bootstrapping scheme. This has an implication for VIMP since computationally what happens with VIMP is that um, it's actually computed almost for free. Because you have this out of bag data, when you grow a forest, you can compute an out of bag ensemble. And so right away you can immediately calculate prediction error and you can immediately calculate um, the VIMP. But as soon as you start to fool around with the, 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 um, the technique for resampling, then it may not be computationally simple to actually compute um, VIMP. And so computationally, that's an issue. And it applies to force regardless of the outcome. In fact, if you look at this previous tree, I said this was a survival tree, but you really couldn't tell that this was, this was a survival tree, right? It's just splits left and right, but there's no outcome on that. Minimal depth doesn't use that information. The outcome is actually used to construct the tree. Okay, so here's um, a little bit of distribution theory. Um, so what, I've, what I'm showing here is the density for the minimal depth um, as this product. And um, I'll, just, I'll just highlight a few things that are important. One is that there are three quantities of relevance here, pi, theta, and L. So pi is the probability that if you have a variable, it splits at J, it's a conditional probability. Theta is the probability Sorry, pi is probably that it, it's a candidate variable for splitting. Theta is the, is the probability that given that the variable was selected as a candidate variable, you actually split on it. And L are the number of nodes at a given depth, okay? So if you have these three quantities, you can actually write out the density for minimal depth. Um, I think if you, if you look hard enough, you might be able to convince yourself that this first term is really sort of measuring the probability um, that the variable V is not split at a depth less than D, whereas this, this, this term here is measuring the probability that it eventually, that it does split at depth D uh, amongst one of the LD nodes at that depth. Now for this, this uh, distribution result to hold, there's, this is the second part. Um, the, the key is that these values, pi, and theta must not be dependent on the terminal, on the node of interest. They can only depend upon the variable and the depth of the variable. Um, and so that assumption um, could be satisfied in many ways, um, but one of the most fruitful ways to, to sort of get at this is just to, to think about what if V is, is a noisy variable, okay? So suppose that V is completely unrelated to the outcome. Um, then it turns out that under these two conditions that um, both pi and theta would be independent of the terminal of the node that we're looking at, T. Um, and it also turns out that condition um, two will automatically hold in a sparse setting. So if you, if you have a high dimensional sparse scenario, then condition two holds. And condition one will hold if M divided by P goes to zero. So what's P? P is the number of variables and M here is M tri. Okay, so this is the number of candidate variables that are chosen to split a node when growing the random tree. So for example, if you choose m equals square root of p, then this would hold. In fact, square root of p is one of the classical default m tri settings used. It's used in survival settings and classification settings. However, as I'm gonna argue, this is actually way too small. Square root of p value is way too small to be effective at high dimensional scenarios. Uh, <coughs> um, so, under um, conditions one and two, a nice simplification occurs. So you get pi times theta equals one over p, and, uh, and presto, you get a very nice description for the null distribution. So if v is noisy, it's unrelated to the outcome, and you know the um, number of nodes at any given depth, then the probability that the minimal depth equals a value can be written out in this closed form expression. Um, all you really have to know is the number of nodes at a given depth, which we can calculate 
by using forest average values. So once you know the density, you can do all kinds of things with it. So for, for one thing, we, we define a thresholding rule, right? So we call this minimal depth threshold. If you take the expected value, the mean value under this distribution, then simply compute the minimal depth. This is the forest average minimal depth. So each tree will give you a minimal depth value. Just average them out over, let's say, 1,000 trees if you have a forest made of 1,000 trees. And then just check whether this value is less than the mean under this null distribution. If it is, that's your variable, select it. Okay, so it's a very simple tool for um, selecting variables. Okay, so um, I, I wanna illustrate this um, using um, some data that's related to long-term survival and uh, ECG. So electrocardiography um, at, at many hospitals like the Cleveland Clinic is, um, is a, uh, a non-invasive diagnostic tool for assessing the functionality, dysfunctionality of the heart. So it's a technique for uh, monitoring the electrical activity of the heart. So, um, you know, as the heart um, pulses through its cardiac cycle, um, the upper chambers, the atria, and the, the lower chambers, the ventricles depolarize and they repolarize. So it's kind of like its own little engine. It has its own little electrical box. And these electrical signals um, send out a wave over the heart, which can be collected by placing electrodes near the heart and through the body. Um, so the schematic on the bottom shows placements of electrodes in what's called a 12 lead ECG. It's a sort of standard um, ECG methodology used in hospitals. Um, so <clears throat> this information is, is collected by the electrodes and, um, and usually they're displayed in what's called an ECG trace, um, as you can see in the top hand uh, plot. So um, hundreds of variables are typically collected from um, a standard ECG analysis, maybe up to 500 variables in some settings. But what happens often is that cardiologists will actually provide what's called a qualitative assessment of the ECG. So they're trained to look for very specific um, deviations from a normal trace. This is a normal trace. And from that, they'll, they'll assign a qualitative uh, assessment of whether the heart is functioning properly or not and they can tell whether certain things are happening. Um, so there's been some interest in whether um, very subtle signals in the ECG measurements are, are being missed in these qualitative assessments. And so uh, this is not a new hypothesis, but we thought it'd be very interesting to test this with a machine learning method and this new variable selection technique that, um, that we've developed. So, uh, and we had plenty of ECG data to work with. Right now, there are over 1.2 million digitized records available at Cleveland Clinic, and we're starting to learn how to harvest this and, and uh, sort of connect it to the different databases that we have. So we put together this um, interesting cohort, about uh, 19,000 patients or so. Um, all of them were suspected of cardiovascular disease. All of them underwent stress testing followed by um, ECGs in which they all had qualitatively normal uh, ECG uh, assessments by a cardiologist. So what we wanted to do was, given these variables, so there were 346 of them, uh, a few of them clinical, I think probably about 12 clinical and all the rest ECG, could we predict long-term survival and which of the variables were at play? So we're, was it all driven by clinical variables or was there something going on in terms of the ECG measurements. Um, for the outcome, we used all-cause mortality uh, obtained using the Social Security Index. And um, we had plenty of deaths, about uh, 1,742, mean follow-up time of uh, 11 years. So here is the first, I'm gonna show you the VIMP analysis. And this is what I see over and over and over again in these high-dimensional problems, which um, is one of the reasons I, I have problems with using VIMP in these, in these applications. So, um, here's the importance value in terms of percentage as the number of variables increases. And as you can see, it's this sort of, you know, long tail distribution. You've got, you know, maybe one, two, three, four, five variables that sort of stick out. Uh, and then you've got a, like a lot of variables that have positive VIP. So positive VIP is supposed to indicate a predictive variable. Here's the log of the importance. You can see it a little bit more um, blown up. So here's one, two, three, four, five variables. By the way, one and two and three are, are clinical variables. It's not surprising they come up. But what about all these variables? So they all have positive VIMP. Surely uh, you don't need over 150 variables to predict long-term survival. Where do I draw the threshold? And, and that's the problem. We don't really know how to do that. There's been really no uh, 
um, progress made on, on uh, developing theory for VIMP. Okay, so here's the analysis that we, um, we showed in our JASA paper. Um, on the x-axis is the minimal depth. That's the first order statistic. Uh, on the y-axis, I've also plotted the second order statistic. So that's the depth to the second closest maximal subtree. Um, this big dashed blue line here is the minimal depth threshold. So that's the mean under the null distribution. So all these variables here are, are, are considered to be significant under this thresholding rule. So one, two, and three, age, low heart rate recovery, METs, which is uh, exercise capacity, uh, age adjusted and gender adjusted. And then uh, a bunch of sort of variables that are sort of sitting in the middle and lo and behold, they're all ECG based. Um, what, what I also found very interesting though, so, so the first thing, remember that um, minimal depth is not prediction error based, right? So it's this concept about real estate and it should get at the idea of prediction error, but does it? So what we did was we, we actually fit models sequentially based on the variables that we found in the, in the, and ordered them in terms of minimal depth and then fit the models and looked at their test set performance. So this is the Harrell's concordance error rate. Uh, this is the R squared and Kreps uh, continuous rank probability score, which are Breyer score based methods. And as you can see, you get this either monotonic increase or decrease uh, in prediction error, as you would expect if you had used a measure that was based on prediction error. But we're, we didn't use a measure that was based on prediction error. So we're seeing a nice drop monotonically. And I think also interesting, we were sort of, you could see that the model, the prediction errors are all sort of plateauing around 5 to 10 or you know, uh, variables, which is very consistent with what, what we found. Um, so that's good because it means that um, this is not a statistical significant effect. It's not a statistical effect. This is an effect that's being felt at the level of prediction error. And not surprisingly, this is actually translating into real differences in survival. So here are the predicted survival curves um, for two, five, and eight years for the top variables. The uh, variables one and two here are age and met. So these are, the, these are the clinical variables. And I've indicated them here so that you can get a, a feel for the range and the survival um, so that you can compare them, right? And you can see that the ECG variables are having a real effect on survival, okay? So it's not just a statistical effect. This is a real predictive effect. Okay, so now um, I, I kind of, I want to kind of get into this question of how do you select m -tri? That's the number of variables that you, you look at when splitting a node. And node size, so how far do you actually grow out a tree? How many values do you have in a terminal node? And to, to sort of get into this, the first thing I want to ask is, and, and look at, is this question of how big can P be relative to N, right? So we're starting to see massive data sets, and usually the sample size is much, much, much smaller than, than P. So, you know, and I gave an example of this. Um, so what we found um, in, the, in our JASA paper was, I guess, not surprising. Um, so the first conclusion that we found was that trees are, are certainly not immune to overfitting. So if you overwhelm a tree with variables, um, minimal depth thresholding basically saturates and it just becomes uh, literally impossible to do uh, accurate variable selection. So the question is, what's the, what's the cutoff? And to study this, um, we looked at the... Um, we looked at the null distribution of minimal depth under assumption of a balanced tree. So a balanced tree is like a Christmas tree, okay? So um, at any given depth, you have two to the D nodes. So you have one, two, four, 16, 32, 64. In other words, every time you split the tree, you split the tree in such a way that half the observations go to the left and half the observations go to the right. Now, the reason for doing this is that under a balanced tree assumption, you know exactly how many nodes you have at any given depth. So it's a convenient assumption. Now, I'm going to talk about how, how viable an option it, uh, assumption it is actually in a second. Um, on the y-axis is the mean minimal depth under the null. And on the x-axis is the number of variables. And the different curves indicate different sample sizes. So the first thing uh, you'll <laughs> see is that the mean minimal depth thresholds eventually independent of the sample size if the number of variables are large enough. And what it's thresholding at is the, is the limiting depth of a tree, which is log base two of n, right? Under a balanced tree assumption, you get for a tree based on a sample size of 256, no more than a depth of eight. You can't grow the tree out further than eight splits. After eight splits, the data is gone. 
Um, and then, you know, this goes back to the, the fact that trees are very greedy, they're recursive. So the data gets used up very, very, very rapidly. So even with very large data sets, you can only grow a tree out uh, to a certain number of, uh, of splits. Um, <clears throat> so the other thing that we did was we computed um, the point at which the mean middle depth plus one half of the standard deviation would exceed this threshold, this, this um, uh, limiting minimal, this limiting depth value for um, a, a given tree. And what we found was that this value was very closely related to P. So for example, if you have 256 observations, um, which means that the tree is going to threshold at about uh, eight, then it takes about 751 variables before you, you hit the saturation point. Okay, so it's something on the order of N. What this would indicate then is that you really can't do accurate variable selection once P gets too much larger than N. Okay, but the question is how much larger? Well, you, that provides an exact prescription for it. The only problem is recently we've been thinking about this whole balancedness, this assumption of tree balancedness, and as we've been thinking about it, we realized something, we found something very unusual, and that was that trees are extremely unbalanced in high dimensions. They don't look at all like Christmas trees. In fact, they kind of just look like skinny, skinny trees with very, very, very few um, leaves at any given depth. Um, and and the, I'll, I'll explain why this happens, but I just want to show you some empirical evidence for, for this. Um, so here, um, is a benchmark survival data set, the PBC data. And um, on the x-axis is the tree depth, on the y-axis is the number of nodes at a given depth. And so if this tree were balanced, uh, the sample size in this case is about two to the eight, then tree depth should, ba uh, should saturate it at eight, but they don't. It's far, far, uh, you see values far, far larger than that. Um, for, furthermore, the number of nodes, which should be two to D under the sort of Christmas tree balance assumption, um, are actually way, way smaller than that. So the tree is not balanced. It's very unbalanced. And um, you can also see this over here where you look at the mean mineral depth as the number of variables increase. This has 1,000 noise variables, um, and this goes from 200 to 1,000. To compare this, look at the right-hand side. This is um, under the assumption of um, a, uh, I'm sorry, this is under the assumption of a, a node size value of one. Okay, so this is, here we grew the tree out all the way out so that each um, terminal node had one observation in it. On the right-hand side, we did the same thing, but we set node size to five. Okay, so what happens is that node size affects the balancedness of a tree. And um, the, the reason for this is that um, if you have a um, high dimensional scenario and you've got lots and lots of variables and many of them are noisy, then um, at any given split, you're probably looking at a noisy variable. And because the variable is unrelated to the outcome, when you split on it, it can split anywhere. And it can, for example, split near an edge. Okay, so when it splits, it will create two daughter nodes, one with very few observations and one with many. So the one with very few will get terminated quickly, and the one with a lot will create a daughter node with very few and a right daughter node with many. And so forth. And what ends up happening is you get a tree which is extremely unbalanced. Okay, next we look at um, mTRI. And um, what I've written here is the, uh, the distribution under the alternative. So now suppose that the variable is strong, so it's actually related to the outcome. So in a similar fashion, you could write out the distribution, but now it involves um, an interplay between the signal strength of the strong variable, the depth, and mTRI. Okay, so here is um, the same data set with um, number of noise variables going from two to uh, 200 to 1,000 um, under different mTRI values. So mTRI, which equals the square root of P, is usually the classical setting in survival, uh, for survival trees. And as you can see, over here, this is the alternative distribution. So this is under the assumption that the variable is strong, and these are the, um, the values under the null. As you can see, the, the separation is actually increasing as mTRI increases, right? So if you increase mTRI, the mean mineral depth increases, 
under the null, but it also decreases under the alternative. So it ha you have the perfect separation. So if you have a very strong variable with a very high signal strength, then the best thing to do is to actually choose an mtri value as close as possible to p, which is kind of funny because we almost seem to have gone full circle, right? When you use an mtri value of p, you're essentially doing bagging, okay? Uh, but what this says is that in those very special settings where you have very, very strong variables, that still may be the best thing to do in high dimensions from a variable selection point of view, right? This may not apply for prediction error. Um, on the other hand, there's, there's a delicate balance, okay? So if the variable is moderately strong, then it's a washout. So uh, both under the null and both under the alternative, the mean minimal depth increases. So there's no benefit to having a large mtri value in fact, computational times increase, so there's really no need to do it. And in fact, it gets worse. So if you have a really, really uh, weak signal, but the variable is strong, then there's, a, there's sort of this trading, uh, a trade-off at this point at which now um, having a high mtri value actually is detrimental, okay? And it will actually impede variable selection. So the best strategy then is to choose mtri as large as possible, but maintain the condition that it should be smaller than p. And this will sort of protect you in these scenarios where the strong variable has a weak signal. Um, so here are some simulations that sort of show this. Um, and I think I'm almost out of time, so I'm gonna skip this and I'll just go to my summary, okay? Um, okay, so, so the, first, the first comment is that um, to, to have effective variable selection using minimal depth, node size should be small. And again, this is, it almost feels like I've come back full circle. So um, in the original sort of prescription for random forest and in bagging, the idea is to grow a tree out really deeply because this is the best thing to do um, in terms of bias. And then you handle the variance by doing ensemble averaging. So the fact that node size should be small perhaps doesn't seem to be a great conclusion. But the reasoning here is different. The reason for having a small node size has nothing to do about prediction error. It has to do with actually um, creating a distribution for the mean minimal depth that's sort of stretched out. If you don't do this, the mean minimal depth saturates. All the variables have the same mean, mean minimal depth and there's no way to select amongst them in any accurate way. The second conclusion is surprising. So mtri should be large, okay? So in usual forest applications, mtri is much smaller than p, but this indicates that mtri should be very large. We want to have strong variables competing as much as possible when splitting a node. If they compete enough, then they're gonna get picked up. If it's too small, you can't pick them up. But if you, make it, if you allow too many um, variables to compete, at some point, the weak variables will dominate the tree and you will be unsuccessful. Finally, in terms of computations, um, so as you increase mtri and as you decrease node size, it takes more and more and more time. So um, if we want to start thinking about really scaling these problems up, and, and I think forests can really scale to massive problems, we need new tools. And I, one tool that we've been using is random splitting. So rather than actually using deterministic splitting, where you search over all possible um, potential split points, you randomly select the split points. And finally, parallel computing. Um, so this is one of the things that I think is often overlooked um, with forest. So unlike a method like bagging, uh, sorry, uh, unlike a method like boosting, forests um, grow trees independently, right? So each tree, remember um, Bryman's definition, right? Each tree is grown using some sort of IID prescription. So they can be grown independently. If you have a thousand processors, you could have each processor working on a tree independently of one another. And then you just simply have to take that information and collate it at the end. And that is great news for Scaling, scaling this methodology to, to massive problems. Um, and, and I'll stop there.